Sorry I didn't get on last night and read. I forgot and took my teeth out. I didn't. <laughs> I was that lazy. I didn't want to put my teeth back in. Chapter 10. <sighs> my return to the bell, book, and candle is far less triumphant than I had hoped. I tug open the intricately carved, they always describe the front door, intricately carved front door and bump directly into a man backing toward the entrance. Can I help you? I exhale the phrase with a heap in helping of snark. Ah, Miss Moon, my savior has arrived. Rory Bombay slips an arm around my waist and gently spins me between him and Rio! A warning. I laugh in spite of Rory's desperately tense jaw. I see you've met our mascot, Pie Wacket. Pie responds with a Row! soft but condescending. Clearly, he is not a fan of the term mascot. I'm sure he would prefer fearless leader or perhaps God King. Spoiled little demon spawn. <laughs> As much as I admire your intelligence, Miss Moon, I will be forced to emphatically disagree. That is a deadly predator. No high school plushie. I'll settle him down. I knows what's what. I don't like this guy. I'll walk toward Pie Wacket as I admonish his poor manners. Pie, Mr. Bombay is a guest. You will not eat our guest. I reach down to scratch his head between his lovely tufted ears and receive a sharp warning thwack from his right paw. That's exactly how Grand Kitty is, Nikolai. He's fine most times, but you never know when he's going to bite or scratch. I say, uh, I say warning in spite of the pain because he did not extend the claws. Uh, he did not extend in the claws and claim a chunk of flesh, Pi runs up the circular staircase before he can properly be scolded. Oh, that fiend, I search the surrounding air for Graham's oddly vacant. She normally swoops in to defend the little reprobate. Thank you for defending my honor, miss. I spin around and wave my hands and surrender before he can finish that sentence. Look, I've already got one eligible bachelor in this town stuck in the friend zone with that Miss Moon nonsense. Please call me Mitzi. That sounded a great deal more flirt forward than I intended. I hope he can't see the flush on my cheeks. Rory's green eyes twinkle with amusement and his broad shoulders relax. I'm flattered that you consider me eligible, Mitzi. He nearly purrs my name, and I feel the heat from my cheeks turn into a tingle in my tummy. Eager to change the subject, I, I ask, was Twiggy helping you to find something? He strokes his stubbed chin and shakes his head. Not exactly. What do you mean? I believe her precise words were, get your grave robbing hind end out of here. I laugh much louder than is appropriate. That sounds like her. What did you say to get her on her bad side? I was inquiring as to the possibility of gaining access to the rare books loft. Did you make an appointment? He steps closer and lowers his voice to a husky whisper. I was hoping for a private tour today. A fresh ripple of tingles washes over me, but it's quickly erased by a flash of icy warning. From the mood ring on my left hand, I can't risk a peek, but I can sense with all my newbie psychic powers that something is not at all right. Rory steps back and narrows his gaze. Is everything all right, Mitzi? Something about the way he emphasize, emphasizes everything sends another flash of warning through my aura. I'm just spitballing here because I don't know what to call the area around my body that is not my fleshy actual body. I remember plenty of Sedona woo-woo folks using the word aura like it, I guess that's supposed to be woo-woo, was a real thing, so I'm trying it out. 
Rory takes another step back and straightens his wool coat. Perhaps I've caught you on a busy day. Next time I'll make an appointment. He bows slightly and disappears out the door before I can reply. I thought he'd never leave. Adult diapers. <laughs> this is my life now. I'm 21 years old and I'm going to have to start wearing adult diapers because my grandmother is a terror ghost. I'm sorry, dear, but that man is bad news. You get Silas over here. He'll back me up. First, I'm going to change my pants, and then you can tell me all about how the road to hell is paved with sexy green-eyed men. For goodness sake, at least give Silas a call before you go and change. Then he'll have a chance to get over here by the time you're ready. Graham swirls around me and puts on her very best sad puppy dog ghost face. I march to the back room and take a deep breath before I try my luck. Twiggy. Grams calls me to have another accident. Would you mind calling Silas and asking him to come to the bookshop while I go put on some dry clothes? Twiggy slowly rotates her captain's chair, turning away from the computer screen and toward me as her eyes take in what I'm sure is a hot mess, she replies. Sure thing, your highness. Any additional mandates? Not at this time. I head upstairs and leave Grams to haunt Twiggy into submission. By the time I clamber back down the wrought iron staircase in my never trust Adams, they make up everything. <laughs> T-shirt, Silas has arrived. Greetings, Mitzi. To what do I owe the pleasure of your invitation? I'd like to discuss Lido's case with you, but Graham's has more pressing matters. She swirls over his left shoulder, and I see him shiver with the inevitable ghost chill that everyone but me seems to experience. Please continue. When I came back from interviewing Artie, Rory Bombay was here at the bookshop. Silas turns and paces between the stacks. I told you that man was trouble. He's far too interested in whatever that book is. We may need to upgrade security at the bookshop, both the physical and the alchemical. What's the big deal? So he's interested in reading some books. Is that a bad thing? Silas emerges from the stacks and fixes me with a truly intimidating glare. Do you recall the story of how your grandmother and I discovered the means to tether her spirit to this bookshop so that she might have the opportunity to make your acquaintance after her death? Well, clearly I know the answer to this question. Is he testing me or does he actually think I'd ever listen to him when he talks? I actually do remember. Grams wanted to find some way to hang around and because she knew she was dying, she had time to plan for it. You helped her out by reading the books. Precisely. Cyrus steeples his fingers and bounces his jowly chin as he waits for me to catch up. Oh, I see what you did there. I'm sure Twiggy can handle getting a physical security system installed. And I can handle the more magical alarms. Silas moves to the bottom of the circular staircase and unhooks the chain. The no admittance sign drops, and he turns to look at me. Perhaps you should accompany me. Much of this work is beyond your current skill level, but it never hurts to take advantage of an apprenticeship opportunity when one prevent presents itself. Sweet, I'm in. The disappointed look in his eye and the ghostly tisk from my grandmother warns me too late that my over-eager response is inappropriate. He rethinks his route and steps off the stairs. We shall start with the side door. Silas in his crumpled brown suit shuffled to the door that leads to the alley. I fall into step behind, beside him. Can we talk about my thing now? Certainly, Mitzi. So, I went to see Artie at the substation. She was the one who pointed out the thing. No pointed out that the time of the accident pointed out the time of the accident could be calculated based on the amount of snow that had accumulated on Lido's body as he lay in the road. Sounds like an intelligent woman, sure, but it doesn't really help me. That information was already in the police report. I asked her if she saw anyone leaving the area 
that she arrived long after the accident had happened. Driveways? I give myself a secret pat on the back before answering. I ask that. All the driveways in the pines apparently empty onto the side streets and the driveways on the other side of Pin Cherry Lane didn't have any tire tracks that crossed the street. In fact, she said there were no tracks in the snow on the other side of the body, almost like whoever hit them backed up turned around and drove back the way they came. And where did she find the body? I don't know where, it, he's not dead, is he? Am I so totally out of it? I keep talking about the body. She showed me on a map, it was just between Spruce Street and First Street, just like the police report said. I asked her if she could be more specific, and she said it was probably somewhere around 1872 Pin Cherry Lane. Silas makes a little sound, which I'm not sure if I should identify as a gasp or squeal, but in my experience, Silas does not squeal. He turns slowly, and the look in his eyes is proud and kind. Then you have your proof. Proof of what? Basically, every bit of that information was in the police report. I had a weird feeling that whoever stole the angel statue saw the hit and run, but I didn't find out anything new. I didn't get any piece of information that confirms my weird Clara cognizant message. Silas raises one thick gray eyebrow, didn't you? I rummaged through the contents of the interview in my mind. It wasn't that long an interview, so it's not difficult to review the facts. Well, about the only thing that I didn't know before I talked to Artie was the exact place where the body was found. A smile grips the corner of his normally saggy mouth as he replies, Indeed. I glance down at the mood ring on my left hand and the boiling black storm clouds blow away to reveal that pristine footstep in the snow. What's the address of the house where the robbery took place, I ask. If memory serves, it was 1874 Pin Cherry Lane. His answer is equal parts smugness and satisfaction. I think I need to go see the sheriff. Silas places a firm hand on my arm. We must attend to matters here before all else. It's definitely not a request. An undeniable sense of compulsion floods through my body. However, I'm going to go ahead and convince myself that I've decided to stay of my own free will. All right, show me some magic. Silas removes a marking pen from his inside coat pocket. This is an ultraviolet marking pen. The symbols I will draw on the doors and window casings will not be visible to the naked eye. However, their parent power and influence will create the necessary barrier to any malevolent energy attempting to infiltrate the perimeter. Infiltrate? Perimeter? Are you like a wizard soldier now? As we have discussed on more than one occasion, Mitzi, I'm an alchemist, not a wizard. And my concerns regarding the intentions of Mr. Roy, Rory Bombay are more than valid. Did your grandmother share any of his history? His history? The man is barely 10 years older than me. I doubt he could have much of a history with my grandmother. Grams floats in with a regret. <sighs> hint of regret wrinkling her ethereal brow I hate to burst your bubble dear but that Rory scamp is older than he looks I said I suddenly don't think I want to hear this story well whether you want to hear I point to my lips and shake my head lips did not move Grams well you're going to hear the story it's for your own good she pressed presses her burgundy no she preens her burgundy gown and begins my fourth husband was affectionately called 
a railroad tycoon. I waved my hands to interrupt. Wait, I thought your third husband was the railroad owner. I mean, didn't my grandpa Cal Duncan own the whole Midwest Railway thingy? Let's just say I have a type, honey. My fourth husband, Joe Willamette, was also in the railroad industry. However, he was Native American. I think it was. My attention drifts as I wonder if the end of, of marriage number three and the start of marriage number four in such social, socially adjacent position. Wait a minute. Doggone it. I lost my place. Okay, hang on. And I was a railroad driver. He was Native American. My attention drifts as I wonder if the end of marriage number three and the start of marriage number four and such socially adjacent position have anything to do with each other. I'd like your full attention, Mazithra. Uh-oh. Former, formal name time. I think I was definitely on to something. Ghost Ma clears her throat loudly. As I was saying, Silas represented me in my divorce from Cal, and we formed a friendship. I smiled at Silas. Graham says you formed formed a friendship during her divorce from Cal. Silas chimes in, the friendship seemed to solidify after I secured her a more than generous settlement from Mr. Duncan. Would you two let me tell this story? Silas and I became friends, and as I started filling this bookshop with items that interested me, I began to build what is now the rare books loft. Silas has always been a curious philosopher, and he would spend hours paging through the magnificent tomes I'd collected while I organized the day-to-day -day of the bookshop. Eventually, his knowledge of the arcane was as vast as any mortal could hope. He became adept at transmuting matter and other things. And, of course, you know how the story ends. I could answer, but I feel like Graham's just made the biggest jump cut in movie history. One minute we're talking about someone reading a few books, and the next minute that someone is creating a portal between the world and the afterlife, a portal where my grandmother can ex exist seemingly forever. In the movie biz, we would say jump cut to ghost of grandma past. Silas chuckles. I wish I could hear her version. It sounds to me like she may have omitted the most torturous years of trial and error. I think you're right about that. Leave it to Silas to keep it real. Let's, pers let's persevere with these protections. I don't believe it would be prudent to allow another night to pass without having taken every measure into consideration. Well, that story didn't tell me anything about Rory. Rory shakes his head. Isadora, she has to know the truth. You can hardly expect her to heed our warnings on faith. Hereafter, hereafter knows you never did. Silas wanders off to continue his emblazoning of symbols, and Graham's returns to finish the story. All right, dear, but I will expect to be given as much leniency as I've given you. I open my mouth to protest, but memories of mumbling names in my sleep bringing back questionable choices in, in the apartment and the re recent interaction with Mr. Bombay I choose to nod my agreement instead. As my collection gained notoriety in, a, in occult circles, Mr. Bombay paid me a visit. He was extremely interested in several of the titles that I'd purchased. 
and offered me exorbitant sums to take them off my hands, but I was more than comfortable financially. And beyond that, there was something unsettling in his eyes. When I mentioned him to Silas, he decided to do some investigating. Silas investigating? So what you're saying is, I'm not the only one who likes to stick my nose where it doesn't belong. A disembodied voice replies, as a barrister, I have a duty to protect my client's best interests. Different words, same meaning, I snicker, grams, ghosts, chuckles. Fill me with a warm feeling of family happiness that I've missed. More than I can say for the last ten years. Please continue with your history lesson, Grams. Thank you, dear. She floats in front of the large six-by-six six windows and continues her tale. Silence. No, Silas suspected that Mr. Bombay was not his real name. Perhaps he had established an it an antiquities dealership under the pseudonym and traveled around the world collecting rare uh, traveling around collecting rare occult tomb tombs and artifacts. Rumors of his collection ranged from fanciful to dangerous. Silas endeavored to test Mr. Bombay's intentions. That sounds like a risky plan. I tilt my head and narrow my gaze. Grams emphatically nods her agreement. We practice the... Uh, we practice the... For lack of a better word, spell that would induce truth. And then we invited Mr. Bombay to dinner. I set up an elaborate private dinner in the rare books loft. Of course, it was before I had purchased all the lovely desks paired with those wonderful green, uh, shoot, green glass shaded lamps. Anyway, I had the loft decorated with beautiful lights to create a magical setting. No pun intended, I'm sure. Oh, Mitzi, you're too much. Grams pushes a shimmering hand in my direction. As expected, he requested our invitation and arrived fashionably late with a bottle of 1805 Torrentus Madeira. During the course of dinner, Silas ex excused himself to open the wine and used our chemical symbols to transmit to transmute the liquid into the truth serum like we had practiced. It was my job to keep Rory sufficiently uh, sufficiently distracted and entertained. I can't contain my overzealous chuckle. Distracted and entertained? Is that what we're calling it now? Now, don't you start with me, young lady. I'm a respectable young woman of means, and I simply needed information. I used the tools that were at my disposal. At my disposal. Ten thirty. At my disposal. I gaze at my at the elegant apparition of my grandmother at her chosen ghost age of thirty five and smile. You definitely were a hot number, Grams. I'm guessing Mr. Bombay couldn't keep his hands off you. Once again, a voice from off stage replies, You would indeed be correct, Mitzi, followed by a deep guttural chuckle. From Silas, all right, you two, it feels like you're ganging up on me. Grams pitches a ghost snit. Grams thinks we're ganging up on her, Silas. I guess we best behave or I'll never get to hear the rest of the story. Understood, followed by a low chuckle. Please continue, Grams. I promise no further interruptions. 
Silas returned with the wine and my sparkling cider and handed us each a glass. Somehow, Mr. Bombay saw through our ruse and switched his glass without us even noticing. Silas ended up drinking the truth. The truth spelled wine and told him everything. Oh, no. My eyes widen and I shake my head to quote Velma Jinkies. I don't know who that is, dear. <laughs> Not important, continue. As you might have guessed, Mr. Bombay was furious with us and promised he would return with an offer we couldn't refuse. His tone was not friendly. The ominous threat does not escape my attention. The Mr. Bombay that I met seems flirtatious, but ultimately harmless. And there's still the matter of his youthful appearance. Okay, okay Grams, I get that you and Silas had dealings with someone named Mr. Bombay. But how can this possibly be the same guy? Are you sure this isn't a son or possibly even a grandson of the guy you met? Silas shuffles in from wherever he had been, wherever he had been marking his symbols and harumphs loudly. The information contained in these valuable resources, he gestures to the books in my shop, can be used for positive or negative results. Perhaps even a fountain of youth as well as knowledge. And to be fair, actions are subjectly, inter subjectly interpreted. What some view as positive, others may view in a negative light. Take your grandmother, for instance. For instance, trapping her spirit here in the bookshop so that you could partake of the opportunity to meet a long host of granddaughters. <clears throat> An opportunity to meet a long lost granddaughter seems wholly positive. However, there are those who would say we have no business tampering with things beyond the veil, and perhaps they are correct. Graham swirls down in a ghostly fury. Don't you dare impugn my decision, Silas Willoughby. Willoughby, you are as much, if not more, to blame. Look at all the good we've done for Mitzi. Why, if, why, if we hadn't been here when she discovered her abilities, who knows what might have happened? Silence. Mitzi, call him what I, Mitzi, tell him what I said. Tell him. I'll do as I'm told. My dear Isadora, I wholeheartedly endorse our decision. I was simply dim demonstrating the effect of perspective for your dear granddaughter. I step between my attorney and my ghost ma. No fighting. I don't want to stand here playing the spirit version of telephone. Let's say I take your side and agree with and agree that Rory is trouble. How do I combat his obvious powers and knowledge? I have some gifts that I don't really understand. A dodgy ring and a giant store full of books I've never opened that hardly reads like the resume of someone who saves the day. Silas adjusts his faded bow tie and smiles. Fortunately, you will most likely not be called upon to save the day. The protections I've put in place will discourage Mr. Bombay from returning and should also transmute his intentions should he cross any of these thresholds and enter your space. Your grandmother and I shall worry and I shall worry about Mr. Bombay while you attend to tracking down this angel thief. I, I'd actually completely forgotten about Dr. Leto and the proof that confirms the clairvoyant or clairsentient message I received. Right, let me head over to Colin Eric and see if I can stir up information rather than trouble. 
Grams chuckles openly while Silas has the decency to at least put a hand over his mouth. I'll see you two later. And that's it. And that's all for tonight. It's almost 30 minutes. Okay, chapter 11, hopefully tomorrow. Be sweet, don't be ugly. Love y'all. Bye.